box with infinite boundaries. Uh, if you take an undergrad class in quantum in uh, the physics department, you'll spend several weeks solving particles in boxes, boxes of different shapes, boxes with uh, you know, barriers inside the boxes, and so on and so forth. Uh, they're fun problems. We're just going to do this one because that's got to give us the stepping stones to talk about atoms. Uh, but I, I would encourage you to, to look these up uh, if you like doing differential equations. Or even if you don't, they're still fun to, to look up. So what we're looking at is we're looking at 1D system, and we're going to define our system, saying that at x equals 0, goes to infinity, and at x equals L, the potential goes to infinity. So we're basically saying that the particle, we put it here, can bang back and forth against these walls, but it can never get out. If you have the walls that are at any point non-infinite, uh, it has the possibility of slipping out, which is why you spend several weeks solving these problems in uh, undergrad uh, quantum. But for now, we're just going to solve this one particular problem. So solving this, we need to write the Hamiltonian, right? Because that's our uh, used in our time dependent Schrodinger equation. H is equal to T plus V. T, which is our kinetic energy, is minus H bar squared over 2M D squared DX squared. V is a function of position is equal to zero if zero less than x less than l infinite for all the rest. Which basically means that we can throw away outside here uh, and we only have to talk about uh, inside. So uh, in this case, uh, We're solving okay. We'll get most of the way through this. We're solving I H bar derivative with respect to time of psi x t H bar which is a function of position only. You can have the Hamiltonians that are time dependent. Uh, we're not going to do that, but you should know that they exist. Take some time. And this is the problem we have to solve. Uh, the way that you go about solving this is by assuming uh, that we can solve it by separation of variables. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, in this case, it does, and it's always a good first check because you can separate out the variables. It saves you a lot of heartache. So, guess, separation of variables. And the way that you check that separation of variables works is you say, okay, well, let's, let's try that uh, the wave function, which is a function of position and time, can be written out as a function of position only multiplied by a function of time only. And again, 
sorry about the notation here, this big T is a, a function of time. It's not to be confused with T hat, and you won't see T hat again in the rest of this problem. But let's make the assumption that, that this works. And what we do is we then substitute our guess in, and we see if we can separate this out into two problems, a position-dependent part and a time-dependent part. So doing that, we get I h bar d by dt x t, and I'm leaving off the function of for the sake of uh, uh, time equal to the Hamiltonian x t. Remember, the Hamiltonian is a function of position only. If it wasn't, the separation of variables fails miserably. Uh, so in this case, in this case, we're able to take that position-dependent part and pull it through because this derivative doesn't operate on the position-dependent uh, function, and the time, as the position-dependent uh, operator does not act on the time-dependent function, which means I can pull the time part out here, and that lets me write I h bar x d by dt of t is equal to t Hamiltonian x. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, multiply both sides of the function by the x and t dependent uh, functions, which means that I can cancel out this position dependent part and I can cancel out this time dependent part, and I'm going to wind up with i h bar 1 over t d by dt t is equal to 1 over x h bar or h uh, hat x. Okay, so I've got two expressions, a left-hand side and a right-hand side. The left-hand side only depends on time. The right-hand side only depends on position. And the only way that two functions that depend on different variables can equal each other is if they're equal to some constant. So this allows us to separate what would be a gnarly equation into two uh, less so equations. Yeah. Oh, uh, so why uh, did you move t before the Hamiltonian operator? Oh, uh, over, over here. Okay. Yeah. Because the Hamiltonian depends only on position. So uh, this operator, for example, uh, where is it? It's over here. So the operator is actually going to be. Uh, H is equal to H X is equal to negative H bar squared over two M uh, the D D squared D X squared. So I would take this and substitute it in uh, here. Uh, there's nothing in the operator that would interact with the time, uh, so that allows me to, to just pass it through. So I've got two equations now, and that gives me, I don't need any of this. That allows me to write I h bar 1 over t d by d t t equals alpha and 1 over x h bar x equals alpha. Now, notice that this looks like h x x is equal to alpha x x. So our time, our time independent part now becomes what 
people refer to as a time-independent Schrodinger equation. So we're going to be solving this, and because Hamiltonian is the operator of energy, we're going to be getting eigen function, uh, eigen values, which are measurable values of energy, and eigen uh, functions, which are the functions corresponding to the energy. So it's, it's kind of commonplace for people to, to rewrite this, and you'll see this in textbooks as H V N X. That a lot of times, you know, a lot of your undergrad texts, they'll just jump straight in and say, you solve this equation, you get the energy. Well, this is where it comes from. So let's go back to uh, the time-dependent part, and we'll solve the time-dependent part, and then uh, break and solve the time-independent part uh, in the next lecture. So This can be rewritten by h bar d by dt t t e t t. So I I substitute e n uh, for energy because we know that the energy is the um, uh, physical meaning of alpha. And this is the problem we want to solve. Yes? We're taking a derivative, which means we like exponentials. Let's guess t. t is equal to a e to the, we'll call it a kappa t. OK? Well, if we guess that is our solution, testing that it works, and you can guess a lot of things, but I can tell you when you guess this one, it works out right, so we'll skip to the chase. Uh, substituting that into our equation, we get I h bar derivative with respect to time, A e to the kappa t equal to I h bar e kappa t Position and time is equal to some coefficient n e to the minus i over h bar e n t e n x. 
So the next time we will uh, solve for the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of energy. Questions about uh, what we've done here? Got time, so questions about life? Questions about the weather? Yeah. Was your was your guess solution uh, e to the kt? Yeah, e to the kt. Okay. Yeah. And I guess that's a new key answer, but uh, as what the trick was a k. Oh well, yeah, key. yeah, k or kappa. It's, it, it, it goes away at the end of the day. Uh, just some some constant because the Germans so, were so prevalent. We use k for constant. <laughs> yes. Remind me again why we are only using T as part of our argument for the fancy H. Uh, why why we're saying that uh, why there is no why there is no uh, T in H? Well, we're only using T. There's no V. Uh, oh, you mean uh, going back to where the original equation came from? The Schubert independent. Right. That was a postulate. So, what I like about this approach to quantum mechanics is we say there's four postulates. If you apply them and the world works out, then you can trust the postulates. If the world doesn't work out, then there's something wrong with your postulates. So, we're taking the Schrodinger time dependent equation as an assumption. We're saying, well, there's some, wave fun there's some wave function, therefore there must be some wave equation. There's a story about that, which I don't know is true. The, the myth is that uh, there was a, a, a conference in, somewhere in Switzerland, and uh, someone had said during the first half of the lecture, and you know, therefore we have a wave equation, and everyone was skiing in the afternoon, and, sh and the shooter didn't and he said, well, there must be a wave equation, so we're the wave equation. I don't know if that's true or not, but it, it, it's a postulate. Wait, I thought we weren't using V because um, the particle can't escape no matter what. We're using V equal to zero in here. Yeah, it should be equal to zero everywhere. Yeah. V is equal to zero here, V is equal to infinity, and it can't escape so. outside. So uh, we have. Uh, where we wrote, we didn't write it here yet, over here, we'll essentially write uh, negative h bar squared over 2m d by dx squared squared plus uh, 0 v and x. So we'll have, a, we'll have v, but it's going to be equal to 0, so we can just throw that away. And when we get to atoms, then in the case of atoms, v proportional to 1 over r, so you have, you have your nucleus, and you have something that does 1 over r, which becomes much more complicated to solve. Okay, so this is where we stopped last time. We were solving particle in a 1D box. We said that it's uh, one-dimensional, so you can think of it as you know, a you know, perfectly thin wire, uh, and the particle is going to sit somewhere in that wire bracketed from 0 to L and outside of L and 0 uh, it's infinite potential so the electron can never escape from there. We said that the Schrodinger equation could be uh, written, we're assuming, as uh, separable parts, an x part and a, and a t part. And then we showed by substitution that in fact it does uh, separate, and we can go from having uh, one equation with two variables to two separate equations. Uh, the position part we recognize as our eigenfunction uh, relation, so we rewrote that in this fashion. So we've got H, our Hamiltonian operator, which we took from our time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation. And uh, oops, I wrote that wrong. Again, the 
again. Thanks. Uh, Hamiltonian gives us a measurable energy and an eigen uh, function associated with each particular eigenvalue. Uh, and then we, we left that, and then we went on to solve our time uh, component, and we found that it has this exponential form, which means that then we can go back up here to the top, and this is where we're at. That all okay? Any questions about what we did last time? Okay. So now I'd like to uh, go back and we're going to solve the uh, position dependent part. And remember, it's the boundary conditions that are going to give us quantization. So this is a um, now a boundary problem. And uh, solving this boundary problem, uh, we have boundary conditions. And we break this up into regions. We have three regions, and those three regions give us four boundary conditions. We have that uh, phi in region one at x equals zero has to equal phi at region two at x equals zero, phi at region two. Region two at x equals L must equal phi at region 3 at x equals L. So just saying that the uh, uh, solution has to be match the boundaries, uh, but not only that, but also the slopes have to match. So we have P by dx of phi in region 1 at 0 is equal to D by dx D region 2 at x equals 0, and D by dx, D region 2 at L equals D by dx, D region 3 at x equals L. So that gives us uh, our four boundary conditions. So now, the next step, if you were solving this you know, in your differential equation class, is you would solve the solution in each of those three regions. Uh, the good news is that regions one and three are very simple. Regions one and three, we're solving the problem that infinity phi is equal to E infinity and the only place where you can solve that is when the eigenfunction is equal to zero. So only the trivial solution exists in those regions. And remember that's because we had a Hamiltonian, which is the kinetic energy operator plus the potential energy operator, the potential energy operator is equal to uh, n1 and 2 and is equal to 0, 1 and 3 and is equal to 0 in region 2. So we substitute that infinity in and that's where the solution for regions 1 and 3 come from. So let's go to region 2 now. And in region two, we have uh, the Hamiltonian, which is just the kinetic energy operator. And remember, we, we saw that came from the uh, momentum operator uh, and is being quantized. Okay, so what's a good solution? Well, we're taking the derivative, which means that we know that exponentials give us probably a pretty good guess of where to start. So, try a e to the i a 
x plus b e to the minus i kx. And because exponentials are a little bit uh, tricky to, to manage sometimes, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to rewrite Rewrite uh, this using cosines and sines, and that's going to give us a plus b cosine kx minus i a minus b sine kx. And because we know that our solution is always uh, complex, we can take these coefficients and merge them together. Plus beta sine kx. And just remember that the coefficients in front of our sine and cosines are actually uh, complex. So let's take this and uh, test out the boundary conditions. So P is zero is equal to alpha cosine. 0 plus beta 0 is equal to 0. And that's because we know that v equals 0, v equals 0 in region 1 and region 3. And that is 1, that is 0. So the only way that this expression can be equal to 0 is alpha must also be equal to zero. So that gives us uh, uh, beta not equal to zero. And if we go P at L is equal to beta sine KL is equal to zero, using the boundary condition between two and three, that tells us that uh, beta is not zero, and it has to be a non-trivial solution. So for a non-trivial solution, the only way we can have that is for a sign of you know, something to be equal to zero, and the only time the sign of something is equal to zero is when that something is equal to zero plus or minus pi plus or minus two pi plus or minus uh, n pi, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3. Which means that KL is equal to N pi, or K is equal to N pi over L. So that tells us the value of, of K. And that means that our solution Pn of x is equal to beta <coughs> sine n pi over L x is 0, 1, 2, So n is an integer. And now we can go back and we can, we can verify that this is going to work for us. Verify this is going to work for us by uh, taking our solution and we'll substitute it in here. So we get negative h bar squared over 2m second derivative with respect to x of beta sine 
n pi over l x is equal to e beta sine n pi over l x. So nothing happens here on the right. On the left hand side, we wind up with negative h bar squared over 2 m single derivative with respect to x of beta n pi over l cosine n pi over lx is equal to that. Taking this derivative a second time, noting that our coefficients can be pulled out in front of the uh, derivative, we get negative h bar squared over 2m beta n pi over l squared beta sine n pi over l x equal to this on the right e beta sine n pi over l x so these values of the eigen uh, function can cancel each other out and that tells us that e n is equal to h bar squared over 2 m oh, sorry if I take the derivative the second time this has to go away. Sorry, the, the plus sign comes out. Because we're taking the derivative of cosine. Okay, uh, h bar squared over 2m n pi over l squared. So we've got quantized energy. And remember, when we solve the problem for a particle in free space, the, uh, the energy can take any value until we put it in a, uh, a boundary, of a, uh, uh, our ring, or in, in a uh, periodic condition, and then we got the quantization. And here the quantization, in the same way, it depends on being bound within a uh, uh, well, and it actually depends on the size of the well. So as you change the size of the well is being bound in, you're going to get uh, a different spacing between the uh, quantization. So right now, we've got everything except for beta. Question. Oh, we're actually going to ask that question. Yep, beta is the next, next step. And then beta's got to come about uh, due to normalization. Because what we have here is we have our phi going to have beta there, sine n pi over L x. And we know that uh, we know that taking uh, the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of psi star x t psi x t dx. Oh, not zero. It has to be one, right? We're basically saying that because we had this statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, that the particle has to exist somewhere between uh, minus infinity and one. So there's a hundred percent chance of finding it. Which means that we now, I'll do it over here, which means that uh, substituting in this, we're going to have, uh, and I'm going to take this beta and a and just merge those together into a single coefficient I'm going to call A. 
this tells me that a squared, this is the a mod squared. Remember, my notation is that a. So a mod squared integral from 0 to L, because the integral outside has to be 0, sine n pi over Lx squared dx. And that's what we have. And that's because whenever we take our exponential and we make the complex conjugate, we change the sign in front of the i and e to the you know, something i minus something i is equal to e to the 0 is equal to 1. Again, that's something that's really handy about uh, all of these things turning out to be exponentials. Uh, so here we are. Now I'm going to uh, make a little simplification here. I'm going to call this q, so I don't have to keep writing that variable. That means that I can now write a mod squared 1 over 2i squared integral from 0 to L e to the i q x minus e to the i q minus i q x squared. I'm using the, uh, uh, the definition. So I said that you can take an exponential and write it out as a sum of sine and cosine. You can similarly take a sine, sine of phi, and that's going to give us 1 over 2i e to the what is it? Uh, i phi minus e to the minus i phi. You can have an inverse relation that allows you to write your sines and cosines in terms of exponentials. And exponentials are great because you get a lot of zeros out of those, or a lot of ones, I should say. So we use that identity to allow us to write these i's. And then it's squared, which means that I just expand that. equal to the integral e to the 2i qx plus e to the minus 2i qx minus 2 e to the i qx e to the minus i qx. Right, this is just a polynomial expansion. Right? squared is equal to a squared plus b squared minus 2ab. So that's our 2ab. The fact that we've got e to the iqx and e to the minus iqx, that gives us e to the 0. So that's just uh, uh, 1. The integrals from 0 to L. And I will... So I've got one there, and now I'm taking the integral of each of these parts. X. So taking the integral of each of those parts, and I'll write it. I'll write it down here, I guess. That gives me a squared 1 over 2i squared times 1 over 2i q e to the 2i to l <coughs> minus 1 minus right, plus minus 1 over 2i q e to the minus 2i q l minus 1 minus 2l. So I took the uh, derivative of the, sorry, the integral of the first term, 
the integral of the second term, and then the integral of the third term, which is just two, and substituted L and zero, and took the difference. And again, because we had a zero, that meant that our exponential went to one. Really handy math. And these will simplify. As I move up here to the top of the board. We will simplify to a squared one over two i one over two i q. Did you meant to square that? Uh, one over square here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, one over two i squared. One over two i q two i sine q two q l minus two l. That's all equal to one still because we had the integral being equal to one. Uh, these two i's cancel, and we're going to substitute back in our value for q to give us, and also we take i squared, so i squared is equal to minus one, so that'll give us uh, minus one over four, or one over two squared, so a squared is equal to minus one fourth L over N pi sine two N pi over L L minus two L equals one. That sine L over L sine of N two pi N has to be an integer. So it's zero. Right, because you're basically taking the, the sine of uh, uh, theta equals zero. Uh, and oh. yeah. the uh, a squared equals. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering if you had done something uh, fancy with nope. the. Uh, it was coming out of my mouth. And, and uh, nope. Yeah, so is that a uh, squared times. Minus one fourth, just from there. Uh, the sine cancels, and uh, or goes to zero. So this entire term goes to zero, and the minus and the minus go away. So you get a squared minus one fourth minus two l equals one, or a is equal to square root of 2 over L. So, at the end of the day, we wind up with square root of 2 over L. And that's our solution. Is that okay? Okay, I should point out that this is true, but there's other solutions. Well, there's other solutions because you can put in different values for n, but there's other solutions because you can change the phase of your solution. And oftentimes you'll hear that you know, you're solving something in quantum mechanics you know, to within the factor of the phase. And when we say that, what we're talking about is we're talking about the phase in complex number space. What I mean is that any complex number can be written in this complex space in which you have real and a real and imaginary axis. Right, so some point here, that point would be A plus B I, or that is A, and that is B. Right? That's 
one way to express it. A second way to express it is you can express it in polar coordinates, in which you say this is equal to a e uh, to the i theta, where theta is the angle between the real axis and the, uh, the vector you're looking at, and a is the length. Now, we say that we solved our shooting error equation. We've got a particular solution to within a factor of a phase, and that's because we never really measure the wave function. We only measure the complex, uh, the modulus squared of the wave function, right? We never measure phi. We only measure phi star phi. Right, because we're measuring probabilities. And what that means, if we're measuring phi star phi, and phi star phi is written in this fashion, I would say e to the i minus times a e to the i is equal to a squared. We're only ever measuring the magnitude of our vector in that polar space. We're never measuring the, the, the uh, phi. Uh, so we say that uh, it does have a phase, and that, that complex phase is actually in here. And when I talked about the uh, writing out the uh, Stern-Gerlach uh, expression, a uh, wave function in uh, 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 as, as a uh, as a superposition, you may remember that I had. Uh, I had uh, 2 over something, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I had something, yeah, I can't remember the, the exactly what it was, but it was you know, something up and then minus i something down. And that's because I chose to write it here, or here, or here. I can change that angle, and when I change that angle, I'm changing the relationship between A and B, but the magnitude, A, I, B, A squared minus B squared, that stays the same, the magnitude of, of that. Is that okay? Okay. Well, what we have right now is we have a particular solution. And we call it a particular solution because that's what it is. Uh, in differential equations, we refer to this as a particular solution where n is equal to some number, like 3, is a particular solution, or n could equal 4. But we know, because uh, of the linearity of the operator, that if I have one solution, and I have another solution, that I can write a third solution as the sum of those two solutions. And in fact, I can do that for all solutions. So I would say, that the general solution the general solution is going to be is equal to sum n equals 1 to infinity, a n b n x t. So it's an infinite sum of all possible particular solutions. And in this, that's our coefficient. 
and this is particular our particular solution. You're seeing a lot of the math is coming back on top of itself. You're going to see a lot of uh, infinite sums of uh, functions uh, throughout this course. Okay, so what do we know about this? Well, we know that our eigenvalues, or I'm sorry, our eigenfunctions right here are uh, are orthonormal, and which means that that uh, if I take the the eigenfunction and I multiply by its complex conjugate and I uh, integrate, it's going to have to go to either 1 or to 0. 1 if it had the same value for n and 0 otherwise. And we also know that if we take our time-dependent solution and we multiply by its complex conjugate, that changes that to a plus, which makes the entire exponential go to 1. So we know now that our particular solution also And here, our particular solution M X G integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dx is equal to del N M our Turner delta. And that's handy. And what makes it handy is because that's going to allow us to determine the coefficients. Now, how do we determine the coefficients? Um, well, we need, we need another value, or we need another measurement, uh, because we used our boundary conditions to get our uh, uh, quantization of our eigenfunctions. And in order for us to know what these coefficients are, we need to know what the wave function looks like at some particular point in time. So to do that, we're going to use what's called an initial condition. So we're going to say that we know psi of x t equals 0 is equal to something. And we have to know what that is. Uh, you know, going back and thinking about your differential equation class, we were solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. We were taking the second derivative with respect to position, which meant we needed two boundary conditions. And we were taking the time derivative once, and that means that we have to have one condition that gives us the time. And, and that's where this is going to come from. And something quite nice about quantum mechanics is that we know from quantum mechanics that if we measure, make a measurement, the wave function collapses to one of the eigenfunctions, right? So, you know, if we just measure the energy, then we know what the eigenfunction is, we know the wave function collapses to that, and that's going to give us what our initial condition is. But for now, let's just say it's some initial condition, and we'll look at how we use that initial condition to get our, to get our prefactors. So let me uh, keep this up on the board for the... coefficients. Okay, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to say that this 
is equal to sum a n x e to the zero because I'm not apparently I'm using this in my notation e to the zero sine n pi x over l n equals one to infinity. So that e to the zero comes about because we put t equals zero into our exponential, which goes to one, hooray. So that means that our uh, wave function at time t equals zero is just a linear sum of signs, summing from n equals uh, one to infinity. Now what we're going to do is we have our and it's called a different value. Let's call it v j is equal to sine j pi over lx. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the left and the right side of this expression by uh, a, uh, the complex conjugate of the eigen uh, function and take the integral. So let me uh, find out that this still is sum n equals 1 to infinity and phi n, right, because this is just phi n. Now I'm going to multiply both sides by, let's say, phi j star and multiply by uh, uh, integrate. And do this. star integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, hooray, we've got a bunch of zeros. We only have to integrate from uh, zero to L because it's zero outside of the zero to L range, but nominally you have to go zero to L because our Kronecker delta uh, requires that. Yeah? Is the normalization coefficient in A and no? Is it contained in Yeah. Or? Yeah. Uh, the normalization co coefficient Yes, it will be. And, and uh, uh, um, the normalization coefficient is still here, but on this side, we're only dealing with uh, that and that, which we know are orthonormal. So our values for the little sub a, a sub n uh, is going to be less than 1, and we know that the, uh, uh, we know that uh, these have to be orthonormal, so they're equal exactly to 1 when n is equal to j, and they're equal to 0 otherwise. Uh, so we got that. Which means that on the left hand side, we still have integral from 0 to L, phi, I'm calling this J star, psi x t equals 0, dx. And then on the right hand side, what I've got is the integral from 0 to L, phi, I'm calling this J times a1 phi1 plus a2 phi2 plus dot 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 plus a n phi n plus dot 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 out to infinity. And well, let's, call it, let's call it j because we know there's got to be a j over here. And because this is a linear sum, it means we can integrate term by term which means each term is going to give us something like this. 0 to L, oops, sorry, that phi sub j has to be complex conjugate, v 
sub j complex conjugate of a1 phi1 plus the integral phi j star a2 phi2 plus dot 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 integral phi j star a j phi j plus dot 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 dot. All of these terms where phi is, where uh, the left and the right side don't have the same value, those are going to become a1 integral phi j star phi 1, 0, 0, 0. This term becomes a j integral phi j star phi j 1 a j. So that means that our coefficient over here, a b n, is equal to the integral from 0 to L of phi n star psi x t equals 0. So what it means is it means that if we have some initial measurement, then for each value of the coefficient, we can take the integral of our known eigenfunction right up here, and that known measurement, and that will give us the coefficient, which means we know, now know the particular solution. We know the energies, which I wrote, erased that. Uh, n is equal to, uh, what was it, h bar squared over 2m, e n is equal to h bar squared over 2m, n pi over l squared, and we know the coefficients of each of the terms. So that means that if, switch colors here, so I've got nice new markers and you hate to be too boring. If we measure, if we measure the energy, and say equal to E5, then that means that An is equal to integral from 0 to L. Write this out sine N pi over L uh, x sine 5 pi over L x dx. And we can put this into there. And this will tell us uh, how the system evolves in time. Questions about this? I think it's pretty cool how the math all just kind of works out, and you kind of seem to see the same mathematical behavior over and over and over again. It's, uh, I don't know, it's kind of pretty. So now we can talk about what this means in terms of superpositions, right? Because we know We know, for example, that we could have a superposition of being in two energy states for whatever reason, right? Say psi is equal to a1 v1 plus a3 v3. Okay. Well, if Yeah, you know, for some reason you know this is our solution. 
Well then, what if we took the, ex the expectation value of the energy? Well, the way we take the expectation value is we take the integral of v star times the operator times c. And we take this from you know, minus infinity to plus infinity. Of course, and our problem is bracketed from 0 to L. Well, if we do that, then it becomes the integral of A1 star V1 star plus A3 star V3 star. These coefficients, uh, they can be complex as well, so it's best just to carry your uh, uh, complex quantity sign all the way through. Times the Hamiltonian, A1 V1 plus A2 V2 dx. If we then multiply those out, we're going to get some terms. Some terms are going to look like this. Some terms are going to look like integral a1 star v1 star h a3 v3 dx. And when you have a term like that, the Hamiltonian, uh, so your coefficients a3 and a1, they're just numbers, so you just take them out of the integral, right? So that would be a1 star A3, you don't have to keep those in the integral. Or you've got your Hamiltonian acting on an eigenfunction. Well, we know that that is just equal to E3 times the eigenfunction 3, right? That's, you know, given our definition, which means that this is now A1 star A3 integral v1 star e3 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 again that's just a number right and if you have a number you can just pull it out of the integral so that will give you e3 here and now you've got two eigenfunctions in an integral and because the 1 and the 3 are not equal to the same they equal to 0 and you have a whole set of these that go to zero, and we'll have another set of these that look like this. A1 star A1 integral V1 star H V1 is equal to A1 star A1 E1 integral V1 star V1 is equal to a1 squared e1, right? The ones that, that uh, don't go to zero. And when you write and multiply all this out, you're going to wind up with this. a1 squared v1 plus a3 squared v3. Oh, sorry, not V3, my mistake. There's an E here, right? So it's E1, and that's E3. The expectation value. But remember, the definition of the expectation value, the definition is the sum of the value times the probability of measuring n. Which means what this really represents is the probability of measuring E1 times the value E1 plus the probability of measuring E3 times the value E3. So these coefficients, these coefficients, A, N, 
L squared is equal to probability of measuring E equals E N. Which, if you think about it in terms of vectors again, that kind of makes sense. Because, like, if this was a vector instead, you would be saying to yourself, okay, I've got a vector and it's written as a sum of other vectors, and the larger the coefficient, the more closely my uh, uh, resultant vector is in the direction of a particular vector, right? Yeah. That last definition of uh, a n squared, is that equal sign inside Here? of the probability meant to be there? A n, yeah. So the absolute value. It's inside the, the, the probability. Right. Where the oh, probability P is of equal e, e equals e n. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is that uh, the uh, absolute value squared, mod squared of a n is equal to the probability of measuring e equal to e n. Or you could just put e n there. There's no formal way of writing that, I suppose. You can just, uh, coming out of my mouth and almost a board at the same time. So in terms of, in terms of our uh, uh, understanding, this is a infinite dimensional complex Hilbert space where functions exist. We can describe it using an infinite dimensional orthonormal uh, uh, basis set, and that basis set is our eigenfunctions. And then any vector, sorry, any function in that function space can be written as a linear sum of the basis that make up that basis space. And we can talk about the projection of that vector in a particular direction because, you know, we had that, uh, what was it? We had this expression, uh, a n is equal, let's call this uh, at any particular time, at a n, at say, you know, t star, that's equal to the integral of v n, not star, let's just call it at some, at some time, is equal to v n psi t. So we were doing t equals zero before, but what it really comes down to is we're taking the, this coefficient is the projection of the eigen, so of the wave function onto a particular basis of the Hilbert space. And then when we have uncertainty, for example, we don't know if it's in energy state one or energy state three. We have a superposition. And that superposition is just saying that I'm taking a sum of, of uh, uh, eigenvalues or eigenfunctions. Pretty cool. Questions? And the next step, of course, is to remember that this is the uh, uh, wave function for position. No, sorry, sorry. The, the wave function, wave function, and this eigenfunction is an energy. And we know, for example, that energy and momentum uh, commute. Therefore, this wave function represents both. But if we were to take, say, make a measurement of position, and we measure the position, we lose information about, about energy. And kind of a fun thing you can do at home, uh, and you should do it at home, because that yeah, it is actually pretty cool, is uh, you should try, uh, you know, solving this out using you know Excel or using Mathematica or whatever you whatever you've got, and try making that uh, well that you're measuring uh, the electron in, make it smaller and smaller. As you make it smaller and smaller, you're gonna see the energies diverge, and you're gonna see yourself uh, 
this sum starts to become you know, absolutely huge. If instead it's a really wide well, uh, you'll actually get a convergence to a, a value at a, at a relatively small sum. So you, you lose information about energy as you uh, increase the confinement. Um, 